Philippians chapter number 3, we're going to begin reading verse number 8. Now, we'll start in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Philippians in the church at Philippi, keep in mind this is a church that was started out of that jailer's house. One night the Apostle Paul and Silas were in prison. They'd been beaten. They were in the inner prison, the filthiest part of the prison, probably up to about you know, 18 inches of muck and mire, but keep in mind, they were chained hand and foot to the wall, which means they were laying on their back. So it was all that they could do to keep their nose and mouth above all of that vile refuse in the inner prison. Not to mention the fact that they'd just been beaten on their backs, they'd been lashed, and they've got those open wounds laying in all that muck and mire. And what do they do? Well, they started praying, got to singing, God sent an earthquake, opened up all the jail cells. That Philippian jailer got saved. Then he took him home to his house, which he was allowed to do. He was a jailer. He could take charge of the prisoners. He took them home, dressed their wounds, cleaned them up, and then his whole house got saved. Amen. That's where this church got started from. And this church knows that that's how the church was started. So when the Apostle Paul writes to him about things like sufferings, and that he... In, you know, in verse number 10 where he says in the fellowship of his sufferings that I may know the fellowship of his sufferings they understand what he's talking about because they experience some of those sufferings in the very town that they live in so the apostle Paul is writing to him in beginning of chapter 3 he says finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord he's saying I have no sad story to tell but these are the things that I do desire. In fact, chapter 4 of this, he was talking about that he was torn between two things. One, going to heaven, and two, staying on earth to finish what God had given him. He said, the only reason I don't want to go to heaven is because God's not finished with me. He's saying, I don't want to face God knowing that I didn't do the full job. But he's saying, it's beneficial for you that I'm still here because there's still you know, parts of the Bible that God hadn't written yet. He wrote a letter to them. If he had been taken to heaven before that, we wouldn't have this passage. Or we would, and the Holy Ghost would use somebody else to pen it. But either way, he's saying rejoice. Rejoice. He's writing this from afar. He talks about how his heart desires to be with them. That he yearns after them in the love of the Lord. That he desires to see them. Then we get to chapter number 4 after this. You find that he couldn't go, but he sent somebody else to go. Somebody who had been sick unto death but God touched him and as a result he's saying just more reason to rejoice he's saying somebody else who was in suffering God delivered him from it but from verse number 7 down to verse number 11 I find what real revival looks like if you really want to know what revival looks like I told y'all two weeks ago I don't know what it takes to have revival God does that's in his hands it is our job to submit ourselves, to yield ourselves, to become humble, as Christ became humble even under the death of the cross, and follow the will of God. And when we do that, I find that our lives will look like verses 7 through verse number 11. Starting in verse 7 and 8. When revival comes, there will be a shedding. A shedding. Verse number 7. But what things were gained to me, those things I counted lost for Christ. Now keep in mind what he's talking about. Right before this, in verse number 3, he started talking about that circumcision of the flesh, the law. What made him a Pharisee, as Saul of Tarsus. And what he's saying, I count all things as lost. What he's talking about, my former life, I count it all lost. He goes on to say that he counts it as dung. We'll get to that here in a second. But what's he talking about? I count all things lost. Do you understand that as a Pharisee, when Saul of Tarsus walked into a room, people took note? 
He was of the elite of the elite. He studied under the feet of one of the greatest teachers of his day if he wanted to become a Pharisee. In fact, he said that he was in Hebrew of the Hebrew elsewhere. What's that mean? Well, if any of y'all ever saw that movie with uh, Tom Cruise in at Top Gun, he was the best of the best. Right? When you were looking for somebody to go and do a job, why do you think they committed the persecution of Christians to Saul? Because they thought they could count on him. They said, that man desires after God. Well, he desired after God so much that when he met him, he forsook everything that he used to know because he found out it was a lie. But, he's saying, we were of the circumcision of the flesh under the, all the privileges that came as a Pharisee. If he asked somebody to do something, they'd have done it. If he got up and taught a Sunday school lesson or in the temple he read from the scriptures, people would do what he taught. They wouldn't question him. He had authority. He had a claim. People gave him praise for his accomplishments. The other Pharisees, they congratulated him for the fact that he held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen. Because in his mind at the time, he thought that he just put an end to a heretic. Somebody that was going against the things of God. But what he found out on the road to Damascus was he wasn't persecuting Stephen. He was persecuting God. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Yeah, it really is. But when he says, I counted all his loss, you guys realize that in order to be a Pharisee, you had to be married under the law? Do you understand that the Apostle Paul had his family disown him under today's terms? He got divorced because he met Jesus and he's saying, I count that as loss. I don't even desire it. I count it as dunk. That means he found it reprehensible. All the privileges. all the, His own family, he says, if it keeps me from Christ, I despise it. Raise your hand in here if you guys went out shopping for dung this week. And most of the time when you do, it's not just, you know, fresh off of the cow pasture what is it it's been processed into fertilizer because you don't want to deal with it you'd rather have miracle grow or something else right nobody says yeah give me a life full of dung but the apostle Paul says since Christ anything that keeps me from Christ is altogether unbearable what was said of Job that he was a man that feared God and eschewed evil that's what made him in faith terms, a perfect man. He was complete in the fact that nothing was going to keep him from God. And one step further, anything that had a chance of keeping him from God, he hated it. He eschewed it. It made his soul sick to even think about doing something that would come between him and God. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. Now how do you get to a state where anything that isn't God's manifest presence in your life. How do you get to a state where anything but that makes you sick? Perfect love casteth out all fear. But what if I lose that? I gain Christ. But what if I have to give this up? You may get more Jesus. But what if they talk about me funny? Don't worry. I've got an advocate with the Father. His name's Jesus. He's bragging on me to the Father. The Apostle Paul stopped caring about what his flesh desired. He shed the old man. Which is, in verse number 8, we'll pick up. Right, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. When revival comes, there will be sacrifice. Not talking about giving things up, Talking about killing the old man. Mom and dad used to sing that song, The Old Man is Dead. Well, sometimes people try and do what uh, Frankenstein did, shoot some electricity in the flesh and resurrect it. 
Why do you think that Christ said, take up your cross daily and follow me? We're not taking that cross to Calvary. That cross is for me to take with me so I can nail the flesh to it every day. And those days when he tries to wriggle free, I got to drive a few extra nails in it. Right? Or a nail because of my you know, lack of awareness, because maybe I'm not being as diligent as I should be. Some of those nails may fall out. I may take some of those nails out on my own. But see, the Apostle Paul said, anything that keeps me from Christ keeps me from knowing the power of his resurrection. We were dead in trespasses to sin. But through his blood, we were made alive. What did Jesus tell Nicodemus in John chapter number 3? You must be born again. Not a physical birth, the spiritual birth. So in order to know the power of the resurrection of Christ, I have to disown who I used to be. That's why he counted it as loss. He shed the old man so that he could become the new man. Not by his own power, not by his own righteousness. We read that in verse number 9. But by putting on the righteousness of Christ through faith. Saying, Lord, I cannot make myself who you want me to be. But I know you can. That sentence gives all control of how God makes us into that new person over to him. The clay does not get to tell the potter what it wants to be made into. The hammer does not tell the carpenter which nails it wants to drive. Right? In fact, the psalmist used the illustration of we are arrows in God's quiver. Well, the arrows don't get to decide which one gets picked. Arrow doesn't decide where it gets to be shot at. The arrow can just be an arrow. The arrow can yield to that knife that smooths off all the rough edges and all the bark. The arrow can accept the fletching, the feathers. Can allow God to fasten it with some twine. Affix an arrowhead to it. And then let loose of it. Amen. Those five smooth stones that David pulled out of the brook, put into his shepherd's bag, they weren't fighting over which one was going to get picked by David. Those stones were just in the shepherd's bag. Well, you study it out, you know where the shepherd's bag was kept? It was on the sling. But it was located right over the heart. When you're just content to be in what God wants you to be, you're going to be close to the heart of God. Amen. The Apostle Paul knew that. Because, see, when we got saved, we understood the joy of forgiveness. We understood the, you know, when we got, we didn't understand all that we got when we got saved. But what we experienced was that joy of knowing that our sins are gone. It was the joy of that new birth. But see, we didn't know about that new life yet. That's a whole different thing. See, if I told you all that you could have every day what we've had around here for three and a half weeks or so, some of y'all look at me like I'm crazy. Well, how are we going to have that outside church? Because the one that did it in here lives in here if you've been saved. Amen. When the Apostle Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, he's saying, I want to know him in the joy of of becoming a vessel of honor for him. That he'd make me into what, I'm, what I ought to be. But why do you think God makes us into vessels? To be filled with him. He's saying, I want to know the joy of not just being a new creature, but the finished work of that new creature, which is perfect fellowship with God. Now I know I can't attain that till I get to heaven. You know, these sin-cursed eyes can't look up and peel back you know, all the layers between me and the third heaven, and I can't see him sitting on the throne. But he does walk with me and talk with me. He did promise he'd never leave me nor forsake me. He was the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Some people only think of them verses and think they apply when they're going through hardness. Oh no. What he's saying is, I'll be as real to you every day as we are real in his mind. Well, what did Brother Sidney Weaver preach on? That's what our current position is not how God sees us. We've got a place. I'm a joint heir to Him. 
One of these days, I don't know when it's going to be, but the Bible says I'll be able to sit in his own throne with him. I'm looking forward to that day. It's probably going to come after about two billion years of us just laying down at his feet and worshiping him. But one of these days, right, he sees me as the finished product. And because of the joy that was set before him, he embraced the shame of the cross so that he could have fellowship with me. I don't understand how that trade worked out, but that's why he did it. So the question is, what all are we missing out on? True revival is when we get so much God in our life every day. Not when we come into the walls of the church. Although if we've got him in here every day, when we show up here, he's going to show out too. But when we become filled with him, that's when you walk down the aisle of the supermarket and somebody stops you and says, hey, you're a Christian, aren't you? When you become filled with him and die out to what you used to be, there is the sacrifice of the old man because you cherish the fellowship every day. Anybody? Ever, hey, Brother Brian, I'll talk to you. You ever be on the way to work? You got some good music in the car. You're just worshiping God all the way to work. And as soon as you get to work, something went wrong and they ask you to fix it. And then you can't even remember what the song, you just get so, okay, well let's go do it. And all the joy, all the worship, everything that was bubbling up inside you, it's like your flesh just put a cap on it. That fountain's still bubbling up, but if we embrace the flesh or if we forget, if we don't utilize the privilege of being a child of the king, it's like it's gone in an instant. I get it. I've been there. Happens all the time. Usually I have to repent afterwards because I get angry because somebody's asked me to do something that they should have done. But anyway... He's still working on me. I'm not claiming to be perfect. But what's the point? When we get to the point that the flesh, the desire to please, we are supposed to do all things as unto Christ. As if Christ asked us to do it. Because really he did. He orchestrated it to where that situation came into our life for a reason. But when I think of it as, well the Lord asked me to do that, I can't do all things as unto Christ if I'm frustrated. If I see what's in front of me and I see it as an obstacle instead of an opportunity. Why were Paul and Silas singing in the jail? Because they said, hey, if we're here, God's going to do something great. Maybe we're going to get to testify in front of the whole city council tomorrow. Maybe they're going to get saved. Maybe God's going to turn this town upside down. They didn't know what God was going to do, but they knew he was up to something. That's why they never blew their testimonies. Because they realized that just taking up the old man, considering that flesh that they had nailed to the cross, he said he had to die out daily. Every day he had to make the conscious decision, no. Everything that could be, all the possibilities that your flesh is going to try and persuade you are worth just giving up something. Well, hey, don't pray today. Might be able to catch the episode of that show you missed last night. Hey, you know what? Don't have family devotion because, you know, you're running late. You don't want the kids to be late for school. Who says you can't have it in the car? Right? Don't at lunch today pray over your food because you're running late and you only got about five minutes to eat instead of the 30 that you normally do. And that's the day somebody's watching you to see, well, hey, was that just a one-off thing? What's my point here? When you lay it down, it only stays dead if you leave it. True revival is, I don't even want to think about the old man. The Apostle Paul said that, you know, as much as he hated everything that he used to be, he remembers it, and he's tried to get over it, but he knows that the flesh is going to keep reminding him. Why do you think he called himself the chiefest of sinners? Because he said, I used to do everything that I could to stop the gospel. He knew he couldn't undo that. But he also knew that there wasn't any good in dwelling on it. Forgetting those things which are behind, I pressed toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Why forget? Because it does no good to remember. That's the old man. It's dead. 
Well, the new man failed yesterday. Well, I can't change that. But I can strive to know him more perfectly in the power of his resurrection today. Spirituality isn't a day-by-day thing. It's a second-by-second thing. Decision by decision. The spiritual man can die as quickly as the flesh did when he saved us. But through his righteousness, through his power, because the arm of flesh is going to fail me, but I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can't keep the spiritual man alive, but if I embrace, I mean, forgetting those things, yeah. You know, there's about four scriptures right after this he goes into the, the end of this chapter I have not apprehended but this one thing I have what's it go on to say he's apprehended that forgetting those things which are behind that's the only valuable thing you can do keeping the old man dead and burying him every day even though he keeps trying to crawl out doing that is the only thing that I can do that's worth any value because I can control me. I can't control others. I can't control what God's going to do, what God's got planned, God's time. I can't do any of that. But I can kill the old man so that I can apprehend God. You know what that means? Both hands. Trying to get as close to him as possible. Like Jacob when he wrestled with him all night. Wasn't going to let him go until he got a blessing from him. But Lord, I'm not going to let you go for anything. Not for a blessing, but just because I love you. Perfect love, cast that out. Well, what happens if this happens? Well, we'll deal with it then. Just live for Christ now. Well, what about this or that? Or Next week I've got this problem. Well, that's a next week problem. We're not promised tomorrow. My life's not only a vapor, it's a wisp within that vapor. But I can live today. Because today is the day that the Lord hath made. Today is the day of salvation for somebody somewhere. And I'm a written epistle known and read of all men. Unless I'm filled with God, that epistle ain't going to have any power to them. Unless I'm filled with God, people aren't going to ask what I have. They're not going to stop and take note. Why do you think that the Ethiopian asked Philip, Philip stopped and said, hey, you got a question about the Bible? If he'd have thought that Philip couldn't have helped him, he wouldn't have asked him. If he'd have looked at him and said, you don't know nothing about the Bible. But there was something about him that says, yeah, I think you might be able to answer his question. And then he got a whole lot better answer because Jesus answered it for him. Felt like I got saved. Right, but not only is there shedding, not only is there a sacrifice. Look with me in verse number 8 again. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Then, we get down in verse number 10, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Twice in these verses. He says, first, I've suffered the loss of all things, but also that I might be a partaker of his sufferings. True revival, what does it look like? There's going to be suffering. Does not the Bible say that Jesus was tempted in all points, like we are, yet he was without sin? Did not Christ have earthly siblings that Mary and Joseph had after Jesus was born? Show me where those siblings followed after and did what God would, do, would have had them to do. The little that we do know about Joseph, I know that he feared God enough to do what the Lord instructed him to do in a dream. But show me where Joseph ever went to hear Jesus preach or teach. We know he's off the scene by the time he's crucified because he commits Mary to John. I don't know what happened. But I don't find any record of anybody other than Mary showing up in any of Jesus' ministry from his family. You're telling me he doesn't know the heartbreak of somebody that you want to be in the will of God, 
want to come to church, want to get saved, but they reject it. You're telling me that he doesn't know the pain in the flesh and also in your spirit when someone tries to ridicule you or mock you? They mocked him to his face about being the son of God as they were beating him and plucking out his beard and planting a crown of thorns on his head, gave him a reed and said, you know, in a mocking way, this is your scepter, this is your power. Tell him he doesn't know the suffering of ridicule. That he doesn't know the suffering of temptation. Jesus was tempted by the devil. Most of the time we only got to deal with the tiny imps. Right? He knew and was acquainted with all suffering. In fact, he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. In the alpha of time, whenever that was, when the Father, the Son, and the Spirit got together, and they said, all right, we're going to make man. We know he's going to fail. And here's the plan. Christ then embraced suffering. He looked in through time, saw all that he would have to do, and said, I'll do it. Why? For the joy set before him. It is through suffering that we become the closest that we can to Christ. Pain is a good thing if that pain comes from trying to draw closer to Christ. Because it's one of two things. It's your flesh fighting against what you're trying to do. Or it could be the world fighting against what you're trying to do. Or it's you having a desire to draw closer and God convicting you of what's keeping you from drawing closer. That pain is a good thing. The pain that is not a good thing is when we resist and then there's chastisement. When we disobey and then we have to reap what we've sown. God never intended us to experience that pain, but through the good pain, suffering for his sake. Maybe physically, maybe spiritually. Whatever that pain is, just like the Apostle Paul, we find that his grace is sufficient for us. We do not experience those pains because God didn't keep his promises towards us. We do not experience those pains because the will of God didn't pan out like the way that we thought it would. We experience those pains because this flesh is at enmity with our spirit. The world, if they're still in sin, is at enmity with the church. We experience those pains because of sin, not because of God. Why did Christ endure all those sufferings? To forgive us of our sins. He who knew no sin became sin and embraced that suffering so that we could be like him. But in following after him, true revival, people say, I embrace the suffering. You're telling me it's not going to hurt to tell family members, no, I can't make it to the family reunion. Well, what if they ridicule you? How come you're not showing up? I got church. They just stopped asking us. They know better. Right? Well, I, I can't, I can't ask off for another day of work. Well, if you did, maybe God just blessed your boss to feel extra gracious that day and give you the day off so you can make it to revival. Am I saying it's going to work out that way? I don't know. But the fear of, well, what if? The pain of apprehension. The pain of facing someone else's criticism. You want to know what the apostles did every time they were criticized? Well, let me tell you why I do what I do. All I'm going to, Peter and John, Acts chapter number 4, we're just going to tell you what we've seen and what we've heard. And that's why we do what we do. We taught on, I think it was three weeks ago, King Agrippa and the apostle Paul telling him, hey, you want to know why I'm here today? Because one day I met the master on the road to Damascus. Amen. And he's saying, since that day, I've been faithful to the Lord to do everything that he's commanded me to do. Even though he was in bonds as he was saying it. But he embraced the suffering because he understood through the suffering, which really, let's break it down. What's the pain? 
the pain is the middle midpoint you're betwixt either doing what God said or not doing it but I don't want to do what God says because I may face this or I'm, I'm not going to church today because I had this happen well what you're doing is you're taking the new man and nailing him to a cross and asking the Lord to hop back up on the cross and saying I don't need you today thanks for saving me appreciate Calvary but now I'm good not today just like with the towel message wiping our feet on the word of God the blood of Jesus that's what we decide to do when pain is the reason that we give up when suffering is the reason that we when hardness is when we give up the only reason it's hard is because your flesh is going to kick and scream and claw and do everything that it can Amen. to hold on to every semblance of what it used to be. Right. It's painful because I am both the new and the old at the same time. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. He made me in Revelation a king and a priest to rule and reign over this body and enter indirectly to the throne room of God through prayer. He's given us it all but nowhere did he say that it would be pain free sunshine and roses but he did promise to be the balm of Gilead the rose of Sharon the lily of the valleys he's saying through the pain I'll be there with you because I've already experienced it my pain becomes minuscule when I remember that he had three nails driven into him he had a spear put through his side true revival is saying he suffered for me and this is nothing in comparison but my family disowned me God didn't Amen. but my best friend won't talk to me anymore my best friend is Jesus and he talks to me every day well this person abandoned me this person left me everybody at work talks about me my kids look at me like I'm crazy well some of you are crazy but you thought that it was all nonsense and foolishness until one day you met the master but what caused you to take a second look because everything else that everybody else had shifting sands but you saw somebody or you heard something that was real enough to catch your attention how are we going to have that if we don't show through suffering that what we have is real? How do we shine as a light when we unscrew the light bulb every time there's a storm? Well, I don't want the light bulb to get broken. Light can't get broken. The light is Jesus. We're just shiny mirrors that reflect. If I get me out of the way, the mirror's bright enough that it might actually get somebody's attention. But on the other end, if every time there's a storm and ships know, well, I can't trust on that lighthouse. We've made the gospel of none effect. Not because God's any less good. Not because Jesus is any less holy. Not because he, you know, didn't die on the cross or raised from the dead. But because I thought that my pain was more important than the pain that he went through. Let's do this. I don't know this. I'm not a lady. Okay? We're going to talk to Miss Christina now. Okay? You knew before you had Lucas, childbirth was painful. But you embraced it because of the joy of having a son. Well, at the time, a child. You may not have known. But knowing all of it, you decided, even though there's pain, even though Tommy's going to have to run and get jalapenos or whatever crazy food she's craving at four in the morning... She said, I'll take the pain for the joy of being a mother. Right? I've got this thing in my back called sciatica. Not fun. But I've become used to it most days. 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't feel it anymore. Right? I've not mastered it. It's still there. But the Lord allows me not to feel it every day. Every now and then, I'll tweak it. It hurts a little bit more. But I can get through it. 
I may have to hang on to the pulpit up here while I'm preaching because I can't stand on one leg. But I've gotten through it. What's the point? We are capable of so much more than our flesh will tell us we are. The flesh knows it's defeated and wants us to be defeated with it. But ever since Eve was told of God that because of her you know, taking the fruit and then giving to Adam, because she was the first one that said she'd have to endure childbirth, childbirth, women for thousands of years have still embraced it for the joy of being a mother. We get the joy of having Christ. Amen. We get the privilege of not just having a title or being associated with them. I'm sure somewhere we can go back through some family trees and figure out we were related to somebody very important. whoop de doo They're dead and gone. Obviously you weren't related close enough to get any of the land or money, so what's the matter? But no, I am a, not just join there I've been adopted I'm a son of the king but I'm also a brother of the Christ I'm the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost and if pain is what I have to put up with every now and then and let's be honest we'll get used to it eventually those things which once used to be mountains to us now are molehills because we matured in the faith and what we're facing today will soon not even be a memory Sure, it may get hot in the fire today, but hey, just like those Hebrews, just like everybody else that's ever gone through a hot spot in their life, if you're faithful, the Lord's there with you. Pain does not separate you from Christ. It's our fear of pain that does. Pain draws us closer to Him. If it's a thorn in the flesh, if it's a kink in my relationship with somebody if it's me having to give up those things which used to I loved but now I count them as dung because I realized that that was between me and God there's blessing and cursing and everything all things are lawful not all things are expedient but just like that song about Mephibosheth the other night where everybody back came unglued and all I know is Brother Amos, I was sitting over here, Brother Amos first went this way, and then he came back this way. I don't know how he got from there to there, but he did. What was the point of that song? The Lord touched me, and I could see. But as Christians, just because we're born in Christ, we've got the new creature, doesn't mean I'm seeing everything as he sees it. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but if I could be doing something that draws me closer to Christ, every now and then he may have to come by, touch your brow again and say, hey, there's nothing sinful about this, there's nothing wrong about this, but if you put all that time or a fraction of that time into just thinking about me, pray without ceasing, fellowshipping with me, reading about me, learning about me, you'll draw closer to me. I guarantee you, the flesh is going to kick and scream. Well, hey, I used to like going out to eat every night. Well, there's a lot of waste of time there. And let's be honest, meals where you get to sit down with somebody that knows Jesus and you just start talking about how good God is, better than any restaurant meal, I promise you that. Why? Because, well, yeah, we didn't get to go out and eat my favorite steak at whatever restaurant or my favorite meal. But I'd rather sup with Christ. Y'all yes. hey. know me. I like Star Wars. Contrary to popular belief, I don't watch all nine movies every week. No, not even seven of them. <laughs> and really, what? Now there's 11 of them. But anyway. Don't. I've got most of them committed to memory. I can play them up here. But just because you enjoy something does not mean you have to become fanatical about everything. You should be a fanatic for one thing, like Brother Bobby said, the Fanatics Club. What's that? Jesus. We should be passionate about one thing supremely. What's that? Christ. 
He said, if we love father or mother, son or daughter, more than him, we're not worthy of him. Why is that? Because if something comes between you and him, we are not worthy of him. We do not know him in the power of his resurrection. Because you know what the key to knowing him and the power of his resurrection is? Verse number eight, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. When we get so close to him that we just start learning things about God from God, and he shows us, well, hey, this could be a stumbling block. All right, Lord, if it's got the possibility of it, let's cut it out. I'll give it to you gladly because I want to know more about you. Because through knowing more about him, that's how he convicts us to show us we're not what he wants us to be. And then we get the joy of giving that to him and having it replaced with him. We know the power of his resurrection because we submit to the knowledge that he tells us, that he teaches us. If all you know about Jesus is what you've heard at church, you're missing out on a whole lot. If all you know about Christianity is what you've heard taught from a pulpit or a Sunday school classroom, you're very weak and anemic spiritually. Because what's done in here is that God will give his man a message. Because he does watch for your souls to either edify you, sometimes maybe to reprove you, or God will take the man of God's words and rebuke you in the spirit, show you that you've been doing wrong. But what's done in here is to keep our eyes focused on Christ so that when we leave here, Christ can do the real work. Amen. He rewards those things done in secret openly. And when we learn in secret openly, we will have the presence of God on our lives. That's revival. Not great services. Although, hey, hallelujah for great services. Amen. Hallelujah for people getting saved. Yeah. For prodigals coming home. Hallelujah for things getting so just saturated with God that people don't know whether to whoop, whether to run, whether to sit there and bawl their eyes out. Hey, I had myself a time. But that is a privilege of the obedience up until this point to the will of God. But if we do it all the time, we can have that every second of every day. Sure, there's going to be times where there's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness because there's some pain, there's some hardness there's some suffering that we have to go through but through that suffering we can still have the presence of God I'd rather go through suffering with God than suffering without God I'd rather go through suffering knowing I'm smack dab in the middle of God's will than to look up and, un and where in the world am I Lord how'd I get here I mean it's a great song but that song sometimes it takes a mountain first verse it says that, hey today I faced a mountain and Lord it's been a long time that's why he had to face the mountain he hadn't embraced Christ daily now again it's a great song people have, sometimes people got to go through hardness to realize oh I'm not where I should be it's what happened to the prodigal and God will do it because he loves them and wants to draw them back but there's a lot of mountains that we can avoid if we just follow him and I'd rather go up the mountain with him than have to find my way back to the Father's house without him. But what's it all boiled down to? Me and my choice. If I don't love him the way that I should love him, shame on me for not getting in the altar and saying, Lord, break this hard heart and restore it with the joy of mine espousals when I first knew you when everything was great the grass was always greener because I had you because not only does perfect love cast out all fear perfect love casts out all resistance to what God wants to do you will humbly and joyfully accept whatever it takes to get closer to him do you struggle to find good Bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions if so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.